Adolf Hitler's impulsive desire to propagandise the success of his soldiers, men such as Gunter Prine and Michael Wittmann, would result in a small number of them attaining global notoriety. One of their number would find himself not only the most infamous soldier in the German army, but also the most influential, temporarily holding the power to halt the war itself. This is the story of Otto Skorzeny, an SS officer who would be dubbed by his opponents the most dangerous man in Europe. The conclusion of World War II would find Otto Skorzeny amongst the few survivors of Adolf Hitler's inner circle. But by comparison, his status during the opening days of these hostilities could not have been any more different. Skorzeny was Austrian by birth, having been born in June of 1908 to a middle-class family residing in Vienna. Like most of his countrymen, he suffered greatly during the economic depressions that followed the end of the Great War. A period of his life he would later recall affected him greatly, the harshness of that time teaching him to be resilient and to trust his instincts. It would be while studying engineering at the University of Vienna that the signs of the man Skorzeny would eventually become first manifested themselves. He excelled in his studies, as well as his role in the university's fencing team, which is where he earned the deep facial scars he would later become notorious for. He was competitive and something of a braggart. His love of drinking would get him into trouble with the authorities on more than one occasion. When Germany again declared war on the rest of Europe, Skorzeny hurriedly abandoned the engineering firm he'd spent several years building up from nothing. Instead, making a beeline for the nearest recruitment office, where he expressed a fervent desire to enlist within the ranks of the Luftwaffe. But being 31 years of age, and at six foot four, with imposing physical presence, he was told in no uncertain terms he was too large and too old to be a pilot. Undeterred, he instead opted to join the Waffen SS, enlisting in one of their leading battle groups, the Second Das Reich Division. Any dreams the former businessman may have harboured in relation to career advancement soon died though, when he was sanctioned following an incident with his unit in Holland. Taking exception to the tone of the owner of a hostelry he was drinking in, Scott Sainley drunkenly discharged his firearm into a painting of the country's royal family. With his superiors eager to ease tension between the occupying forces and the local population, the hapless Scott Sainley soon found his service record censured. His background in engineering would land him a role in one of his division's mechanised units, and it was with this group he fought on the Eastern Front. Skorzeny's time there would however be brief, when he was badly wounded during an enemy artillery barrage, something that would occur several more times before the end of his military career. His return home would see the imposing junior officer shunted around a number of supporting roles, his path to promotion blocked, as a result of past drunken incidents and arguments. And then, after two years in the wilderness, he would receive an unexpected invitation, one that would ultimately define his entire career, to head up a new special operations department, designed to strike deep into the heart of enemy territory, causing panic and disorder wherever they went. It was a posting that nobody else within the SS wanted, and that would provide Scott Zaney with the opportunity to shine on a global stage. Promoted to captain upon the commencement of his new duties in April of 1943, Scott Zaney found his new role would be nothing if not challenging. It had been Hitler's personal order, the right create an organisation to rival the British commando units, which had famously been founded at his enemy Winston Churchill's request. But beyond this edict, very little had been put in place to support the idea. From the outset, the new unit's daily business was to identify and then seize the resources of existing departments. Skutzani sat down and examined German evaluations completed in the wake of enemy commando operations and was impressed by what he found. He then returned to Holland 
where the SS had spent several years receiving airdrop British supplies and weapons as a result of a successful counter-espionage operation. But when he attempted to demonstrate the values of weapons, such as a silent Sten gun and shaped explosive charges to his superiors, they were dismissed out of hand. Despite his best efforts, he couldn't defeat an ingrained culture that no other nation could produce a weapon finer than those possessed by the Third Reich. Undeterred, Skutzani continued to transfer specialist men and materials into his unit from other departments who'd completed a similar role prior to the creation of his own. He worked extensively alongside the Italian Navy to turn his people into skilled divers and explosives experts. There was also a liaison with the Luftwaffe in order to obtain the pilots and specialist aircraft needed to insert his people behind enemy lines. It would be several months later, while assessing the failure of just such a mission into Iran, that Skutzani would receive another unexpected invitation, one from Adolf Hitler himself. Arriving at the Wolf's Lair in July of 1943, Skutzani was bewildered to find himself being ushered into a personal audience with Germany's leader. The meeting was short and to the point. The Führer's closest ally, Benito Mussolini, had been deposed and arrested by his own government. Skutzani was to locate and liberate Il Ducci before returning him to Berlin. Whatever men and material were required, these would be made available to him. Otto Skutzani was nothing if not an opportunist and realised that fate was now offering him the chance of a lifetime. Making his way directly to Sardinia, he and an aide disguised themselves as sailors and began to tour the local bars in search of leads. What appeared to be initial successes in unearthing where Mussolini was being held were frustrated though, as the fallen dictator was repeatedly moved to different locations by his captors. But Scotzani's persistence, in no small part aided by the chaos and confusion caused in the aftermath of Mussolini being deposed, soon paid off. He learned his target had been taken to the Hotel Campo Imperatore, situated at the top of the Gran Sasso, in the heart of the Apennine Mountains. With this temporary prison being inaccessible, other than via a solitary ski lift, the chances of success of any rescue operation were severely limited. But for Skutzani, to fail in this endeavour was never going to be an option. The story of exactly what took place on that remote mountain remains something of a debate today, a feature that typifies both Skutzani's career and his personal character. What is beyond doubt is that on the afternoon of September 12th, ten gliders containing both his men and a Fallschirmjäger detachment crash-landed onto snowy ground directly outside the hotel. At the same time, a separate force of paratroopers attacked and seized control of the cable car housing, situated at the base of the mountain. It's clear from the lack of casualties, the German troops met little in the way of resistance from the 200 carabinieri assigned to protect Mussolini. In the years that followed, Skutzani would take full credit for the rescue, claiming to have personally stormed the defenders, persuading them that they were hopelessly outnumbered. He also insisted on personally accompanying Mussolini off the mountain in a Pfizer Storch scout aircraft, which had been landed after the hotel had been secured, boasting he'd threatened to shoot the pilot, who complained the aircraft would have been too overloaded to gain height, with all three of them, Mussolini included, on board. Major Harold Moores, the officer commanding the Fallschirmjäger throughout the operation, always disputed this version of events. It was the Major's opinion that Skutzani and his SS men had been bit players in the operation and that it had been the paratroopers who'd captured the hotel. Once that had been completed, Moores claimed Skutzani had then insisted on re-enacting the rescue for the cameras of an accompanying propaganda crew. With the passage of time, the truth will never now fully be known but it was certainly Skutzani who was present upon Mussolini's arrival in Berlin and pictured in all of the official images of that event. In doing so, he had earned a promotion to Major, the Knight's Cross presented by his Führer, and the attention of all of Germany's enemies. Over the next few months, Skutzani's work remained largely in Italy, assisting with the development of miniature one-man submarines and flotillas of radio-controlled explosive motorboats. 
These were being deployed against the invading US Army, but achieved little in the way of success, due to issues that had never been ironed out, through a lack of practical testing. Then, in July of 1944, fate once again came calling for Skorzeny, who had just been coming to the end of a period of leave in Berlin. Skorzeny had just been about to board his train back to Italy, when he'd received an urgent phone call to return to SS headquarters. Once there, he was told of the failed attempt by the army's high command to assassinate Adolf Hitler, and how moves were now afoot by the conspirators to seize the capital. For a few short hours, the fate of the German people and the rest of Europe hung in the balance, as the German army attempted to wrest control of Berlin from the SS. But having hitched his wagon to the fate of Adolf Hitler, Skorzeny's actions would only ever result in the defence of the dictator. Recognising the panic Walter Schellenberg and Karl Student were incapable of leading the SS, he quickly assumed control of troops on the ground, ordering teams of SS soldiers to retake key positions around the capital from the army and to locate and arrest all the suspects in the bomb plot. In doing so, he effectively sealed the fate of the German people for another year, having temporarily held the power to end the war in the palms of his hand, and sentencing to death a whole host of his peers in the process, at the altar of his own beliefs and ambition. Two months later, Skorzeny found himself again summoned to see the Führer, entrusted with yet another mission to try and prevent one of Germany's allies from deserting her. In September of 1944, rumours had reached the Führer that elements of the Hungarian government were actively seeking a peace deal with the Allies. The loss of such a valuable ally would have opened a huge hole in the Eastern Front through which the Red Army would flood, meaning it could not be allowed. Within hours, Skorzeny and his people found themselves in Budapest, with the Major disguising himself as a doctor, walking the streets in an effort to gauge the temperature of the city's population. It soon became clear the main driving force behind the attempts to surrender the country were being made by Miklos Horthy Jr., the son of the country's ruler. Through liaison with the local Gestapo, Skorzeny became aware of a meeting between Horthy Jr. and the leaders of the Yugoslavian partisan movement. As this meeting was about to take place, an SS squad led by Skorzeny ambushed those involved. The Admiral's son was seized and imprisoned. But Skorzeny's hopes that holding the son of their ruler would avoid a Hungarian surrender were dashed, when Miklos Horthy Sr. instead announced an immediate armistice. Arguing against a direct artillery bombardment of the capital, Skorzeny instead gathered a small detachment and made straight for the city's military headquarters. After a brief firefight, he again forced his way to the front of the action, persuading his opponents they were surrounded and had no hope of escape. Admiral Horthy was arrested and the armistice was hurriedly rescinded, with German units quickly moving to take control of the country and its armed forces. Once again, any possible hopes of shortening the end of the war had been completely snuffed out by the same ambitious and loyal servant of Adolf Hitler. Promoted to a lieutenant colonel as a result of his endeavours in Hungary, Skorzeny found himself again recalled to the Wolf's Lair to be entrusted with another secret mission. Trying to ignore his leader's visibly deteriorating health, he listened on as the dictator briefed him on a major operation that was being planned the German army would pull its remaining resources together for a huge surprise offensive against the American forces currently occupying the Ardennes. And at the heart of this offensive, Skorzeny and his men were needed to sow disorder and chaos amongst the Americans, to disguise themselves in enemy uniforms, capture essential fuel dumps and disrupt communication and transport links in order to assist Hitler's panzer divisions pushing through to the city of Antwerp. As before, Skorzeny was promised whatever men and material he required for the operation, which had to be a success. And so he went away to plan what he needed, returning with a demand for 160 English-speaking German soldiers who could pass themselves off as their Allied counterparts. He'd also require 100 captured enemy vehicles to assist his unit in penetrating the American lines, including 15 tanks. But it was only now, the reality not only of the failing German military situation, but also that of his master's deteriorating mind, were made apparent to Skorzeny. Of the 160 men he essentially relieved, 
only 10 could speak English to a degree of fluency to pass themselves off as the enemy. And in place of captured US tanks, he was instead reduced to taking older German models and welding sheet metal to the sides in an effort to make them resemble American Shermans. Still, despite these setbacks, at the commencement of the operation, Skutzeny's Panzer Brigade 150 had been made operational and was sat waiting at its starting positions. On the morning of 16th December 1944, the German army smashed through the American defences in the Ardennes Forest, having caught their enemy completely unprepared. But while several of his teams of disguised agents had headed off to sabotage road signs and capture enemy arms dumps, the vanguard of Skorzeny's forces found it could not deploy to join them. With only limited roads into the enemy's territory, all of which by now were reduced to sludge by the tracks of heavy German panzers, or clogged with troops and vehicles. Eventually, realising he wouldn't be able to bypass the bulk of his own army, Skorzeny requested permission for his men to remove their disguises and operate as a conventional unit. As a result, his force would have little physical impact on the overall result of the battle, but perversely, would actually end up causing even more chaos than he could have hoped for. Unwittingly, the undoing of Skorzeny's forces would be they'd tried too hard to impersonate their enemies. By this stage of the war, most US forces were using a variety of differing uniform types in effort to stave off the winter, including elements of captured German uniform. As a result, when a party of immaculately dressed men dressed as GIs appeared in their midst, questions were immediately asked, only to be answered in broken English with thick German accents. Further to this, the fact the Germans insisted on filling their captured US jeeps to travel around made them stand out like a sore thumb, as no Americans ever seemed to travel with more than two to a jeep, let alone four. As soon as several of these teams had been captured or killed, their SS uniforms discovered underneath their disguises, rumours spread like wildfire across the battlefield of their existence. Not only did this lead to a number of friendly fire incidents and genuine American GIs being arrested, but also a completely false rumour that Eisenhower himself had been targeted for assassination. As a result, the hapless general found himself under virtual house arrest at his headquarters, unable to deploy to the battlefield or direct his troops in person. As Skortzain and his men later withdrew from the failed offensive, he had no idea that what had happened to his men and how inadvertently successful his operation had been, or that he was now the very public face of the SS to his enemy and would forever be associated with any success or failure they now achieved. The closing months of the war saw Skortzain and his unit thrown again and again into desperate attempts to stave off defeat as the German army died around them. In February, he was deployed to the Eastern Front to assist with providing cover for several wandering pockets of trapped German soldiers trying to make their way back to their own lines. The following month, he was then directed to try and destroy the Ludendorff Bridge, which had been captured by the Americans at Remagen. As US forces flooded across the Rhine into Germany, Skutzany deployed floating mines and frogmen in several failed efforts to destroy the bridge. But by now, defeat was looming, and like many members of the SS, he made his way back towards his Austrian homeland and the rumour of a last-ditch stand against the enemy. What he found was chaos, with the Austrian redoubt quickly proven to be a myth, and what remained of the SS either surrendering or disappearing around him. Sequestering himself in a farmhouse, Skorzeny made two unsuccessful written attempts to surrender himself the occupying American forces. But despite a nationwide manhunt for him, with his face displayed on wanted posters and a bounty on his head, the US forces on the ground seemed to take little notice. Even when the giant SS colonel presented himself at their local headquarters, it was several hours before his story was believed and he was taken into custody. And it was at this point, now his enemies had finally realised who they had in captivity, the final battle of Otto Skorzeny's military career began. Throughout the two years he was held in a prisoner of war camp, Skorzeny began to get the creeping sense that his trial at Dachau would not be an easy one. He remained unsure of exactly what the war crimes charges against him would be, up until the point he stepped into the dock. When he did hear the charges against him, the imposing and roguish figure almost found it difficult not to laugh out loud. One at a time, 
He and his lawyer faced each charge and denied it. Yes, his men had infiltrated enemy lines, but no, there had never been a plot to kill Eisenhower, which is why there was no record of such an operation. No, neither he nor his men had been involved in the infamous Malbody massacre, which had taken place during the Ardennes Offensive. That murder of unarmed American prisoners of war had been perpetrated by the 1st SS Division, at the behest of their commanding officer, Joachim Paper. No, his men had not been issued with poison-filled bullets as part of their mission. Examples of such ammunition that were put forward by the prosecution were later proven to possess a waterproof coating, which Scutzani argued was less harmful than the actual round it had been painted onto. Neither had he been charged with the defence of Berlin, or the systematic liquidation of its population who refused to bear arms, as the BBC World Service had falsely reported. Eventually, after many weeks, the charges against Scorzani were boiled down to the fact his men had disguised themselves as the enemy and had fought without revealing their true identities. For the first time, the SS colonel found himself struggling to defend himself, being unaware of the exact actions of his men as he'd not been present with them in the battlefield. But now, salvation arrived in an unexpected but very welcome form. A British SOE agent named Wing Commander Forrest Yo Thomas. To the dismay of the American prosecutors, Yo Thomas explained how SOE agents had routinely operated behind German lines wearing fake uniforms, and how he himself had personally escaped the Buchenwald prisoner of war camp, shooting dead a German soldier whilst wearing a disguise. To the surprise of the newspaper men covering the story, and the others present in the courtroom, Otto Skortzani found himself being cleared of every charge ever brought against him. Despite having been dubbed the most dangerous man in Europe, Otto Skortzani found himself guilty of no known crime, yet still incarcerated in a military prison in Darmstadt by his enemies. This situation would continue for a further two years, as the Americans used the excuse they were liaison with the other Allied powers to see if further charges could be brought. By 1948, the former SS colonel had grown tired of being a prisoner and arranged for his own escape to be carried out by friends who had been released from captivity elsewhere. For a time, he attempted to return to Germany but found he was still too well known there to elude his pursuers and was forced to leave the country. Like many former Nazis, he found employment in both South America and the Middle East at one point taking money both from his employers and the CIA who were working against them. By the 1960s, Scorzani had tired of working for dictators such as Marcos and NASA and decided to publicly retire from the spy business. Yet rumours persisted he still held a high position in a number of former Nazi organisations, hiding his colleagues and funding acts of public terror. He purchased a small estate in rural Ireland much to the outrage of the British government, only for the Irish authorities to state they had no issue with a firm German officer living there who had done them no wrong. Eventually, his wild lifestyle finally caught up with him, and he succumbed to lung cancer whilst living in Madrid in July of 1975. It cannot be denied, Otto Skutzani was an enthusiastic follower of the Nazi movement, having been a member of the party before the outbreak of war. It also can't be denied that many of his achievements came as a result of his own self-promotion or of his masters in order to achieve propaganda value. But it's also clear that Otto Skorzeny was a man with an inbuilt sixth sense of when to gamble and when not to. He was not gripped by the arrogance or the madness of so many of his peers and was able to survive where many others did not. Profiting from his role in the war, living a lavish lifestyle up until the point of his death, he was an innovator and a rogue, and true to his name for the briefest period, he was indeed the most dangerous man in Europe. Music